Hi, my name is Stuart Wienig, and this video covers one method of analyzing TCP application performance. Uh, this same method is used by CA's Application Delivery Analyzer tool, also known as NetQS SuperAgent. I've been working with a NetQS suite of products since 2006, and I've used them at over 120 different customer sites in the capacity of customer and consultant. I've given this presentation many times to explain what a network engineer would do with a packet capture and what SuperAgent does 24-7. My blog at stuart.wienig.com has tips, tricks, and best practices about all the products in the CA NetQS suite of products. I currently serve as the communications officer for the CA Infrastructure Management Global User Community. In order to explain how to decode a TCP transaction and analyze the performance, let's look at an example TCP transaction. What we see here is a user connected through a network infrastructure to a web server in a data center. Our packet capture point is the switch to which the server is connected. In this example, the user is going to perform a simple web transaction. The first thing that happens in any TCP transaction is the three-way handshake. The user sends a synchronized request to the server. We see that send packet as it crosses the switch right before it gets to the server. Since our packet capture point is right next to the server, we can assume that the amount of time between when we see the packet cross the switch and when the packet arrives at the server is negligible, less than a half a millisecond. Upon receipt of the send packet, the server's kernel allocates resources for the TCP session and sends back a SYNAC packet, which we see as it leaves the server. Again, since our packet capture point is right next to the server, we can assume that the amount of time between when the packet left the server and across the switch is negligible. The SYNAC packet travels across the network to the user, and assuming semi-modern hardware on the user's system, the NIC has a TCP offload engine, which handles the majority of the TCP actions. Because the TCP activities are offloaded to the TCP offload engine, the amount of time between the SYNAC receipt by the client and the corresponding ACK transmission can also be assumed negligible. The ACK crosses the network infrastructure and we see it cross the switch just before it reaches the server. At this point, the TCP session is established and the user or the server can begin sending data and or requests to each other. The user needs to pull up a web page, so he'll send an HTTP GET request for index.html. Upon receiving this request from the user, the server will engage his resources to fulfill the request particularly the CPU, memory, and other input-output resources will be engaged. The server may even make a back-end service call to an application server or database server. After gathering the data to fulfill the request, the server will begin sending the data back out to the user. Now, since the data isn't normally extremely small, the server will normally split the data into multiple packets to send them out to the user. In this example, I've simplified the transaction to only show two packets worth of data going out to the user. Since this transaction is using TCP, there are control processes in place to make sure the server doesn't overload the user or the network with data. Part of this control mechanism is the system of windowing in which the server will only send a certain number of packets before requiring an acknowledgement from the user. Once the server receives the acknowledgement from the user, the next window of packets will be sent. Now that the user has received all the data associated with index.html, he needs to get the next portion of the web page, which is nav.html. The user sends in an HTTP GET for nav.html. Upon receipt of the request, the server again engages his CPU memory and other input-output systems to gather the response for the user. Once all the data is ready to send to the user, the data is chopped up and sent out over the network. Now let's say, for example, that there's a problem on our network and the packet is lost. Whenever a server sends out a TCP packet, a retransmit countdown timer is started. While the timer is counting down, the server is waiting for an acknowledgement from the user. At the same time, the user is waiting for the data from the server. Everybody is waiting on the network, but the network has lost the packet. So if that timer reaches zero before an acknowledgement is received, the server assumes that the packet was lost by the network and retransmits the data. If the problem still exists, the packet will get lost again and the retransmit timer will eventually get to zero. When it does, the server will retransmit the packet, which is finally received by the user, and an acknowledgement is sent to the server. After that, the rest of the data is sent to the user and the user acknowledges it.
Okay, now that we've broken down this very simple transaction, we can look at what metrics we can derive from our packet capture. The first two metrics we'll look at have to do with the TCP handshake. The TCP handshake is the most simple request a user can make of a server. Therefore, the amount of time the server and the network handle their portions of the TCP handshake are very good indicators of base application performance. The first metric that can be measured is the server connection setup time. This metric measures how long it takes the OS kernel to set up the TCP session. It's measured as the delta between the receipt of the synchronized packet and the transmission of the Synac packet. Server connection setup time is a very good indicator of the base health of the server hardware and its operating system. It can be improved by increasing the speed of the server hardware. It is also unaffected by changes in network performance or application complexity. The second metric that can be measured is the network connection setup time. This metric measures how long it takes the network to transmit the smallest possible packet, remember the handshake packets have no payload, from the server out to the user and back. It's measured as the delta between the transmission of the Synac packet and the receipt of the ACK packet. This metric gives a good indicator of the minimum network round trip time between the server and the user. Now, under optimum circumstances, the minimum value of network connection setup time will indicate the minimum possible round trip time on a physical network constrained by distance and bandwidth. Now we get to our core metrics. The first is server response time. The server response time is defined as the amount of time it takes a server to start responding to a request. This is measured by taking the delta between the receipt of a request from the user and the first packet of the response from the server. Since we know that the server will have gathered all of the data for the response before starting to send it out, we know that the server has finished processing the request. Deviations in server response time are caused by four main components, CPU, memory, input-output systems, and back-end processing. Any significant latency induced by any of these four components will cause an increase in server response time. For similar transactions, there should be a very low amount of deviation between observations, unless there is a problem with one of those four components. Server response time gives us a good indicator of server performance because it is unaffected by performance problems on the network. The second metric is network round trip time, which is defined as the amount of time required for the network to transmit a response packet to the user and for the acknowledgement to come back. This is measured by taking the delta between the transmission of a response packet and the receipt of an acknowledgement of that packet. Network round trip time differs from network connection setup time since network round trip time packets will usually have payload, where network connection setup time packets will not. Network round trip time obviously measures the health of the network and is unaffected by poor performance on the part of the server and on the part of the client, assuming the client's TCP at offload engine is functioning properly. The third metric is retransmission delay. Retransmission delay is defined as the amount of time wasted by the server waiting for an acknowledgement that will never come because the original packet was lost. This measures the harm done by packet loss. In our example, we had two packets that were lost, so two instances where the retransmit timer counted down all the way to zero. This is unproductive time for the user and for the server since both are waiting on the network, which has permanently lost the packet. Packet loss may not always cause significant delay, but when it does, the retransmission delay metric measures it. The fourth metric is data transfer time. Data transfer time is defined as the amount of time required to transmit all the packets of a response to the client. It's measured by taking the delta between the first packet of a response and the last packet of a response. Since data transfer time can be affected by the server, in the case of poor hardware performance, the network, in the case of large network run chip times or high packet loss, or the application behavior itself, large volume responses will obviously take longer to transmit than small volume responses. As with most of these metrics, the best way to tell if there's a problem is to compare the current value to the historic norm to determine if there's a significant deviation. Deviations in data transfer time can indicate problems in an application only in the absence of significant deviations in server response time, network round trip time, and retransmission delay. By adding these four core metrics together, the last core metric can be calculated, total transaction time. The total transaction time in this case is the TCP transaction time and probably doesn't correlate with the total time required to carry out a single business transaction, which may be comprised of many TCP transactions. Now that we've seen what metrics we can derive from a packet capture of a TCP transaction, we can start to apply conclusions to the metrics. First, let's review the core metrics. 
Server response time, the amount of time between the receipt of a request from the client and the transmission of the first packet of the response. Data transfer time, the amount of time required to transmit the response. Retransmission delay, the amount of time wasted waiting for an acknowledgement that will never come because the network lost the original packet. And network round trip time, the amount of time required to transmit a packet from the server to the client and to transmit the acknowledgement from the client to the server. The sum of these four metrics will give total transaction time. Just by looking at these four metrics in a stacked area graph will give an experienced network engineer a quick and easy way to determine the domain of a problem, either server, network, or application. In the case of the graph shown, there were actually two problems, one around 4 a.m. and one at 7 a.m. Let's break them down individually. Problem number one, you get an email from the help desk saying users were having problems using a particular application at 4 a.m. By looking at this graph, it's easy to see that the metric that deviated from norm was retransmission delay. Just before 4 a.m., the retransmission delay was close to zero milliseconds. Around 4 a.m., the retransmission delay increased significantly, indicating an increase in latency due to packet loss on the network. Right away, the problem can be traced to the network as the server has no effect on packet loss. So given the path and other network monitoring tools, an experienced network engineer should be able to track down where the packets were lost and why. Problem number two. You get an email from the help desk saying that users were having problems using a particular application starting at 7 a.m. and lasting all day. By looking at this graph, it's easy to see that the network is not the problem. Both the network round trip time and the retransmission delay did not deviate at 7 a.m. nor for the rest of the day. This means that the network was transmitting packets all the way out to the user and back at the same speed it was before, during, and after the problem. However, there is a significant increase in the amount of server response time starting at 7 a.m. This increase in server response time could account for the increased latency the users were experiencing. This graph is a real graph for a real customer's application, and by doing an SNMP poll of the server or servers hosting this application just after the problem started, we were able to see that the CPU utilization was at 100%. By looking at the top processes ranked by CPU utilization, we were able to see that backup.exe was using all the CPU resources on the server and slowing down the production application. By tracking down the owner of the backup job, we found out that he had mistakenly set up the backup job starting one week ago at midnight and to repeat every 25 hours instead of every 24 hours. This meant that the backup job was running during the night but starting one hour later each day until a week later it started interfering with production work. So this has been my primer on how to decode and analyze TCP applications for performance. As you can see, doing this by hand is tedious but understanding how the metrics are calculated will help understand how some products like SuperAgent um, run the calculations for hundreds of thousands of transactions every day. I hope this video has been helpful. Um, you can subscribe to my blog at http colon slash slash stuart.weenig.com uh, for more videos to come in the future. Thanks and have a great day.